Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as we look at the epistle lesson for the Feast of the Transfiguration of our Lord, 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten Son, you once confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of the ancient fathers. And in the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wondrously foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Therefore, mercifully make us co-heirs with our King in his glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the collect is perfect for this epistle for the transfiguration of our Lord because it talks about the testimony of the ancient fathers. And I want to begin with the testimony of Moses in Exodus chapter 34. And I want to read it because I believe that our epistle lesson is what they call a midrash, an interpretation of Exodus 34. It is not the Old Testament lesson, I believe, for this Sunday, but um, it, it, I think it needs to be included in our discussion of 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. Um, Exodus 34 says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. When Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Thus, Exodus 24. Now, clearly, one of the great themes of our text is the veil. And you can see that here. I've highlighted it in a couple of ways here so that you can see how the veil comes out. I put it in this, this nice little um, gray color. I think I missed one when I was looking it over again. No, actually, I put it here, the face. But I mean, I, I put, put the face here, too. I mean, th these are things that you can clearly see are, are very much a part of this text, um, at least in the first part. Notice that we end with the face of Christ and we begin up here with the face of Moses, you know, having the veil over it. So what, what we have here is this, this really, I think, very interesting interpretation of Exodus 24 because of the context in which Moses, excuse me, in which Paul found himself in 2 Corinthians. Now, one of the ways to read these epistles is to recognize that Paul is addressing opponents. And I think the opponents here are a little subtler kind of opponent that you might find uh, in, uh, in Galatia. I mean, we sometimes call them Judaizers, but they basically depended on the teaching of Moses and the teaching of the Old Testament as being part of of the way of salvation. And by that, I mean that they were teaching that the, the teachings of Moses, as it says in Acts 15, are necessary for salvation to keep them, the law of Moses, such as circumcision in Galatia, such as other laws in some of the other epistles. And, and one of the things that I think is being taught in this epistle to us on this feast 
of the transfiguration is that at the end of the day, the only thing that matters in terms of understanding the, the, um, the significance of the Feast of the Transfiguration is that in this feast, we see, in a sense, what Moses sees, but without the veil. Um, you can see here how important the language in Christ is. Here, you can see in, in, um, in the end of verse 14 that it clearly says um, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Now, that is something that the opponents of Paul in, in Corinth were not, uh, were not saying. And you can see down here, I put it all in green, how important it is to understand that the gospel that Jesus brings is a light, you know? And here you can see that the notion of the shining, the glory. And, and just, I mean, just look at what it says there in verse 3. And, you know, some of these um, texts over the lectionaries have changed a little bit. And, and we do have the option of not reading this whole text. But I think you got to read more than just simply 12 and 13. I think you got to read 14 to, to 18 because it's so important in terms of understanding the entire sweep of the argument. But anyway, here, here you have in, in verse 3 where, you know, he's talking about how our gospel is not veiled, you know. Or actually, he says it in sort of, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing, you know. Now, the, the gospel is veiled to the opponents of Paul in 2 Corinthians because they are reading uh, through the law. They are not reading through Christ. Um, they're people who, you know, don't see that the entire Old Testament is about Christ and that it is related to Christ. And, and then you can see the, the language of the gospel again here in verse 4. But now it's called, as you can see here in verse 4, um, the light of the gospel in the glory of Christ. Now that glory is first seen, of course, in the transfiguration, our text today, which is a foretaste of the resurrection. And this is a vast difference from Sinai. <clears throat> and I think it's very important to make that, that clarification. Also, you can see here in verse 5, where he says very clearly that <clears throat> what it is that we proclaim. Now, that's, a, that's such an important word. This is that performative speech. This is, is the, what the word kerygma comes from. We don't preach ourselves, okay? Those are the opponents in 2 Corinthians, the so-called Judaizers. But what do we preach? We preach Jesus Christ as Lord. Um, and the suggestion is that they're not preaching that, you know? Whether that's true is hard to say. But... Look at the full sweep of this verse. It's for we proclaim, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus um, as Lord, with ourselves as your servants. Look at that. With ourselves as your servants on account of Jesus, for the sake of Christ, okay? Now, this, <clears throat> this, this begins to sound like atonement language. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many on account of, on behalf of someone else. So, I mean, if, if I'm preaching on this text in terms of the transfiguration, I'm going to really focus in on this section and the fact that the gospel is a light, and you know that that's important to Paul because you come down here where he, he ends with this beautiful statement that, that is a quotation from Genesis 1-3, let, let light shine of the darkness. Uh, this light, same word here, you know, 
of the knowledge of the glory of God, there's the connection there with glory, is seen in the face of Christ. And of course, you can't help but think the face of Christ in the transfiguration. Now, sadly, the, the language of, of Jesus' face shining is not in Mark's gospel, it's in the other gospels. But you can really see here, though, that the, the key is, is the, the difference between the old and the new, and how the new now um, is manifested in the transfiguration of our Lord. And uh, uh, that is a foretaste of the glory that we now see in the resurrection, which, of course, the transfiguration is but a foretaste of. Now, let's go back to the top of the page. Good. And, um, and, and just see how, how this might, might build. In, in a way, what you have in this text is the first part, you have the Old Testament kind of story, the veil, you know, um, with a hint here how in Christ, um, it, it, in a sense, is taken away. But, but look at how this, 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 this first part in which he's telling the story of the Old Testament and, and how it was insufficient. It did not fully, you know, and even the veil was, was not what we think it was. It was something much different, much, much, much more subtle in a way. Uh, as one author says, and I just want to read it to you here because he says it better than I do. He says, um, the, the skin of Moses' face shone because he had gained direct insight into the Sinai mystery. The missionaries, that is the, the, the opponents of Paul, the Jewish Christian missionaries, consider themselves and only themselves to be in possession of the Spirit. This permits them, like Moses, to perceive the glory of Sinai so that their bodies and faces reflect the presence of God. Against these missionaries, Paul argues that Moses had used the veil to prevent the Israelites from realizing that the glory reflected on his face was fading. And that is because of what Paul says later on about the law. The, the law was, you know, it was a parenthesis between... You know, well, actually, the best, but, but just say between Sinai and the coming of, of the Christ. And if you look at, at verse 18, it's such an important verse there. And it says, and we all with unveiled faces. This is, this is the, the, the Christological hermeneutic that we can go back now and see all of what happened to Moses on Mount Sinai and the veil, we can, all, we can read all of that Christologically, okay? With unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord. Now, I think beholding the glory of the Lord is a liturgical statement. Um, and, and that beholding of the glory of the Lord is beholding it in such a way that, that we participate in it. Because I think that's what he says in the next verse, that we are being, and look at that word, metamorpho, metha. I don't think Mark uses that word. I think it's a Mathean word. I know Luke doesn't. But the metamorphosis of the transfiguration, that's a transfiguration. Word. And our icona, our, you know, our image, our identity, our, that we are an icon of Christ here. From one degree of glory to another, that's such an interesting phrase, and I'm not sure what to make of it, but I think by baptism, by faith, by preaching, and by, by participating in the body and blood of Christ, we participate in the glory of God. And, and as it says there, um, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And I think the, the Lord who is the Spirit is a reference to Jesus. The, the Lord is present by the Spirit. Anyway, the, the, this, this is a very important uh, kind of conclusion to this section that, that really opens up the second section. I want to just, just again, emphasize the, the language of Icona here because, and I hope I can find it, it comes later on here, and it's, 
in reference to Jesus. Um, Maybe I, oh, here it is. Okay, here it is, right here. It's at the end of verse 4. And let's go back and, and just translate that verse there. Um, to keep them from seeing the light of the gloss, gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay. So it's, it's another one of those frames where you have this remarkable, you know, frame of, of the face of Christ and the face of Moses. And then you've got the frame here of the icon, you know, where is it here in verse 18? The icona, the, the, that our face is metamorphosized, the, the glory, and here the, the icon of Christ. Um, so uh, let me just sum up a little bit here what, what I think, and especially in terms of the transfiguration. One of the most remarkable things about the transfiguration among many is that you do have Moses and Elijah coming from heaven to the mountain where Christ is. And then you've got these three earthlings, Peter and the, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, coming up to Christ, you know, and they're meeting here. And it, it, it's all about the glory of Christ. Those of you who have translated this with me, in Luke at least, maybe you had class with me, that it's only Christ's glory. Their glory is, is from Christ. It's from heaven. And they're, they're coming down with a conversation, and they're coming up this way. And, and I, I've always said that, that, that this, this is a figure of the liturgy, where heaven, Moses and Elijah, and earth the earthlings here, are joined together in the person of Christ. Now, I think in many ways this text can be a, a way of, of helping you to, to preach that because it is talking about the things that I said before, that, that you know, th this glory that we experience here that is metamorphosized for us, as it says in, in, in verse 8, that we are transformed into the same image as Christ from glory to glory. This happens liturgically. It happens in the Eucharist. And it happens because we have this hermeneutical lens en Christo, in Christ, you know. And, and you know, I, I don't want to push that too much as a baptismal image, but it says but it's only in Christ that it is taken away. And that, that's the, this in Christ, I think, is here the, the language of light, which is, of course, the language of baptism, that we are enlightened. So, I mean, there are so many different ways in which this passage does such a beautiful job of kind of coalescing with the gospel lesson. I really encourage you to preach on the gospel, but you can use this text to support many of the things. And of course, Mark's version is a little bit shorter, so you might need some other things to, if you, you know. But I mean, the transfiguration is one of the great moments in the church's life. And as I, I know, I, I think I said in the, the, uh, the podcast on the gospel that the, the, the season of Epiphany is now framed by the voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased uh, at the baptism of Jesus. And then essentially the same thing at the transfiguration. And that in the transfiguration, we stand there and we look over the valley of the shadow of death, you know, the shadow of Lent, I should say, to, to Easter and to the resurrection. So there's just some wonderful stuff here. And I think Second Corinthians... Uh, three and four was well chosen to be a marvelous way of illustrating many of the wonderful themes that we have in this season of Epiphany and on this Sunday in which we celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration.